Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are here in Hernando County kind of celebrating Water Conservation Month during June. So we're kind of aiming all of our classes to touch on water conservation. And a great way to save water is through micro irrigation in your edible landscape and gardens and vegetable gardens. And fortunately, we have a real expert here. And Yasalonis, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Anne, is mm -hmm. with Polk County Extension. And she is going to uh, tell you a little bit more about herself and what she does. And she's going to talk about installing micro irrigation in edible gardens and landscapes. Let me mention one more time here that if you have a question, just go to the bottom of your screen and click on chat and go ahead and type your question in and I'll get all those questions. And at the very end, we're gonna have time to go through all your questions and get them answered live here. So, Anne, let me go ahead and turn it over to you. It's all yours. Sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Whoops, let me go back. All right, so, um, as Bill mentioned, um, I'm Ann Yasalanis. I am the Residential Horticulture Extension Agent and the Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator in Polk County. Um, and we um, do very similar um, outreach and programming as, as is done in Hernando County. So um, I guess the good thing right now is that there's so many webinars available that um, you know there's a, a lot to choose from and so much to learn. Um, and I'll share some of the stuff that we have coming up that you're welcome to join in on. Um, and I'll share that at the end. Um, but today we're gonna talk about micro irrigation. And just to, to mention that again, um, uh, we'll take all the questions at the end so that we have a um, you know, good clean recording and um, you know, things may get answered as we go along. Um, so just a reminder, you're welcome to type into the chat at any time um, during the presentation, but we'll we'll go through and read all of those questions at the very end. Um, so I'm not going to be opening the chat or anything like that. And if you would just um, quick reminder to um, make sure your mic is off. Sometimes it also helps to turn off your um, your video as well. I'm going to turn mine off here in a second when we get started, and then we can all turn everything back on at the end if that makes it easier and a little more fun to to answer questions. Um, so we will go ahead and move forward here. All right, so we are gonna talk about micro irrigation today and um, just a few tips before we get started. So if you're celebrating Water Conservation Month, these are all really great tips and there's just so many ways to conserve water in the landscape in addition to micro irrigation. So combining a few of the changes that we suggest can create a water saving, beautiful and healthy landscape. Um, ULF IFAS Extension in Polk County has a number of blog posts and I'll um, link those resources at the end. Um, um, we have some things providing tips for water conservation that just might be some supplemental to kind of help you continue to learn more. Um, and before we get into micro irrigation, it's important to mention the importance of grouping plants by their water needs. Um, so grouping plants helps make irrigating easier. It helps when selecting the type of irrigation emitters you'll use um, and how often you're gonna be running your sprinklers. So nets, whether it's rotors or pop-up sprayers or micro irrigation. Um, so that might be something you kind of need to keep in the back of your head and think about um, as we talk through micro irrigation. And you know, if those are questions that you're kind of, you know, oh, I didn't think about that before, we can try and answer those too. Um, so today we're gonna focus on ways we can conserve water using micro irrigation. Um, you might be considering micro irrigation for one or both of the following uses. Maybe you wanna convert high volume landscape sprinklers to micro irrigation or install micro irrigation in an area where you previously had no irrigation. Um, so those are, are two, two reasons people want to do that. Um, um, a little bit of research background before um, 
you know, just to, to kind of share a background on some on micro irrigation and, and why you would look to, to choose that. Um, there was a UF study on ornamentals. So that would mean like um, shrubs and, and plantings that are in mulch beds. Um, uh, mixed turf and ornamental landscapes that use micro irrigation in landscape beds irrigated um, 74 millimeters a month over an entire landscape, which is equal to 55 a month. And that ends up being like 16,000 gallons per thousand square feet as compared to 105 uh, for irrigation with sprinklers only. So if we're looking at 55 for micro and 105 for um, you know, regular types of sprinklers like pop-ups and rotors and things. You can see that the savings is about half. So um, that's kind of some nice information to know because um, you can really do a lot of conservation through the use of micro irrigation. Um, okay, so what is micro irrigation? Micro irrigation is a way to water plants that uses low pressure, low flow rates, under 30 gallons per hour. And there's a variety of applications and emitters that can be used. It can be found in many retail garden centers and big box stores. Also irrigation installation companies can install these systems. And your existing system can be retrofitted or changed to accommodate micro irrigation. So whatever you have now, there's a system that will work. And we can talk through that if you have questions. So micro irrigation can be installed above, on, or below the surface of the soil. It is inexpensive compared to with other types of, of systems. And again, you can retrofit something that you may have that's existing um, to, to make micro irrigation work for you. Micro irrigation is flexible in its use and it cannot be watered to, used to water lawns. Um, so, you know, got to take that out of the equation there, but potted plants, vegetable gardens, mulched beds, um, those are all really great places to use micro irrigation. I gave you some facts before on, um, on water usage in terms of uh, measurements, right? But it's also been shown um, that micro irrigation is 90% efficient versus a 50 to 70% percent efficiency of traditional sprinkler systems. So me, that again means more uh, water savings and then actually more um, money savings too on your, on your water bill, which is always a good incentive, right? So one of the biggest advantages of, of the precision watering that you can get from micro irrigation um, is, is what people tend to look for because of all of the advantages that we'll discuss in a minute. So, um, with that precision watering, um, it can lead to reduced weeds, potential disease reduction. Um, and that's a really big benefit, particularly when we're looking to use it on vegetable gardens or plants that tend to have issues um, with, with wet leaves and stuff like that. It's easy to install and then change, move, add to, I mean, it's very flexible and that flexibility makes it easier to work with when with than with other irrigation systems and that flexibility is often what people enjoy um, about micro irrigation. So I mentioned ways you can use micro irrigation and it's important to note that while it's exempt from watering restrictions, um, at least in Polk County still, we want to be mindful as to when we irrigate. So even if something is exempt doesn't mean we should use it all of the time, right? So we want to um, make sure we're not watering in the heat of the day or when, the, when high winds are present. And you wanna to stick to those normal, um, those normal early morning hours um, that you would typically irrigate. So that's when we're gonna you know, reduce water loss through evaporation and, and wind and, and things like that. So keep those normal um, early morning hours. And turn it on during the day every few months to do your maintenance check. I mean, you should be doing that with any type of sprinkler system anyway, um, but, but that's just for on for a few minutes at a time every month. Um, the flexibility to meet varying water needs and the ability to expand or change up systems is a great advantage for sure. So these are the types of micro irrigation we'll discuss today. Um, if you look at, um, the, the pictures, we're gonna talk about micro sprayers. We're going from left to right here, bubblers, 
the inline drip and drip emitter. And we'll talk about um, how, they, how they work, um, maybe different uses for them. Um, and then we'll get to some general maintenance at the end of the presentation as well. Okay, so first up we have drip emitters. Um, they're used when plants are spaced further apart. They can also be used for potted plants and hanging baskets. Um, there are even um, some uh, manufacturers that make uh, almost like a drip tubing like the photo on the left that um, has kind of a flexible wire in it that people can use to fill um, bird baths and other things like that as well. Um, the emitters can be punched directly into the header tubing, um, which you can see on the photo on the right. So that main line of poly tubing there has that drip emitter punched directly into it. Whereas the photo in the left, um, the emitter is attached to what's called spaghetti tubing that leads to the plant. So you can tell the size difference there. And so when we say spaghetti tubing, um, we mean that very narrow tubing that's usually used off that main line which again looks like the photo on the right, that, that half inch poly tubing. Um, and then the spaghetti tubing is, is small and you know, makes it flexible to, to come off of that main tubing and put those emitters where you need them to be. Um, so those are the two types of drip emitters that you'll see. Um, the precision offered by drip emitters is great for vegetable gardens. Um, they'll keep foliage dry, eliminate excess water between rows that contribute to weeds. So, um, uh, lots of uses there, and I'll kind of show you an example. Um, so here you can see how drip emitters are used um, to water potted plants. So what you're seeing here is spaghetti tubing that's coming off of a mainline poly tubing, and it's being put into the, um, the potted plants. Really, you could do this type of situation with any of the, the emitters that you wanted to, but this is a great application for drip you know, if you've got one plant in there, you know, a tomato or an herb or even flowers or whatever, um, you can put that, that drip emitter right at the base of the plant and it will efficiently water that way. All right, next up we have inline drip tubing. Um, inline drip tubing is placed on or below the soil surface or mulch. Um, and drip tubing is ideal for vegetable gardens or, um, in a situation where plants are in rows, the flexible tubing can easily be wound through plant beds. Usually it's the same size as that, um, you know, half inch poly tubing that, you know, was on the previous slides, but this one has the drip um, built right into that tubing and you can see it there. Um, spacing on drip tubing is predetermined and you can use these evenly spaced emitters as a guide for installing transplants or when thinning out seedlings in a vegetable garden. So you purchase the drip tubing um, with the, uh, the drip emitters here at certain um, distances apart. Um, so 12 inch, six inch, that sort of thing. Um, again, those are all predetermined. So you'd need to know what you're planting and your spacing for those plants prior to purchasing that, that drip tubing. Um, and so here you can see um, it used in a planting bed. Um, so the drip tubing is manufactured with inline emitters. Um, or tubing with separate emitters attached. Drip tubing can be placed under the soil surface as we talked about. Um, I would suggest, and most of the time you see where it's like this and it's placed on the soil surface um, and then mulch is applied on top of that. So this type of irrigation can be completely hidden, which is good and bad at the same time, right? So it has those evenly spaced holes. It can be customized um, with separate emitters. I mean, most of these types of um, systems and emitters can be pretty well customized. You just kind of have to, you know, figure out what you want to do and how, how to do it. But um, all of this is, is poly tubing and pretty easy to work with. So again, an option for using this is to match the plant spacing to that of the, the distribution holes. Here you can see this is coleus. So this is annual beds. Um, in Polk County, the city of Lakeland plants all their annual beds. So these are our seasonal flowering plants. Um, uh, in uh, beds that have the drip tubing in them and they just space the annuals and select the annuals based on the spacing there of that, that, that tubing that they, they use. Again, this works really well for vegetables because again, they're gonna have to be spaced um, a certain number of inches apart as well. 
All right, and this is bubblers. Um, they're installed on short stakes or directly into the tubing. And that's what you see here. The bubblers are usually um, something that water either 180 or 360 degrees. Um, and they do have an adjustable flow. So if you can tell here, this almost looks like a little dial that you can turn up or turn actually all the way off, which is kind of handy if you're establishing something um, or you don't wanna water something all the time. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, they are used to establish or maintain a larger plant material most of the time. They're not always the best choice for vegetable gardens, um, but are great for um, fruit trees, blackberries, blueberries, other large edible plants. Again, they're often used in trees um, similar to, to something like this, where you'd have um, uh, the trees and um, a bubbler would be placed at the base of that, that large tree. Um, they can be installed directly on the main line tubing or on short stakes that usually come off like the, the spaghetti tubing, like the drip emitter. So think exactly of that photo of the drip emitter, the bubbler would look very similar. It's putting out more water, obviously, because of the way that it you know, bubbles out. Um, they typically have the highest flow rate of all the emitters, but again, they can, um, they can be turned up, down, and actually all the way off. Micro sprayers are, are very similar in that they can also be turned all the way off. Um, these are, are very um, commonly used in lots of different situations and are very flexible in their use as well. So they're used above the surface. The micro sprayers are gonna wet a larger portion of the ground and emit more water than other types of micro irrigation systems. Um, they can be used to water in seeds that have been directly sown, containers, large planting areas. Um, this photo here, you can see um, this uh, yellow or this orange spray head um, and the pattern that it's throwing. Um, and typically all of the micro sprays um, have different heads that are interchangeable that just twist on and off that are used for different sp spray patterns. So whether it's you know 90 degrees, I think there's 45 degrees, 360, um, some of the 360 ones um, like this one here, they'll throw eight to 10 feet. So um, these are, are, are pretty versatile. Um, and then again, they can be shut totally off or turned all the way on as well. So they're on stakes. They can be a variety of colors and heights depending on the brand and the style. Um, so I've seen green, I've seen uh, gator orange and blue. If you don't wanna make it that noticeable, there's black and brown colors available too that blend in. But these are definitely gonna be more visible in your landscape bed than you know, inline drip tubing or any of the other ones we discussed for sure. There again is a wide variety of spray patterns and spray heads. You get a lot of flexibility from these systems using micro spray heads. Um, and so with this one here that sprays an eight foot um, 360 degree area, you know, this wouldn't be used to water at the base of one plant, rather it would be used, you know, in a planting bed where maybe there's um, a variety of perennials or something like that where it will spread water over that whole area. So it certainly has a very different use um, than a, a drip emitter for sure. Um, so again, it's, it's really important to know what you're irrigating um, before selecting the type of micro irrigation um, emitter that you're gonna be using. So we discussed the types of emitters and you know, kind of what they look like in the landscape. And let's take a look at an example of what a, a simple setup using your outdoor hose bib might look like. So if you have a hose bib on the outside of your house or you know, somewhere in the yard that you can tap into. That's what a lot of homeowners end up using because it is, again, really easy. You don't have to um, do any work with PVC or your existing system. This can be a totally separate thing. Um, so this might be what you get in a typical, like a starter kit um, with a micro irrigation system. And there's lots of brands that kind of carry a, you know, a box with a variety of starter materials. Um, certainly they all have a way to purchase parts separately also. 
Um, but these are some things that if you purchase them separately, you need to make sure that you're getting, and also if they're in the, the starter kit, need to be installed. So um, to connect from the hose bib, you have to have a pressure regulator there um, into that main line tubing. And it's essential because micro irrigation is low flow. And if there's any issues with um, too much pressure, it's very noticeable. And, and particularly with things like the, the micro spray heads we just talked about, if you've got a lot of pressure, it'll blow the, um, the spray heads off of all of those. So that's a really good indicator that you've got to do something there. So usually there is um, a pressure regulator at minimum, and then there's a start, the female start that attaches from the tubing to that pressure regulator. And you see here a filter as well. Those don't always um, come in a starter kit, um, but can be installed, particularly if you have um, a water source or worry about sediment, um, because there are so many small parts of the micro irrigation system that clogging can be an issue. So a filter is always a very safe thing to add um, to any type of system, um, just to, you know, to, to get control on any, any sediment. All right, here's another graphic showing a simple hose bib connection and setup. Um, typically, uh, you'll just need a pair of scissors. And then usually the, the um, brand of micro irrigation that you've purchased has some sort of a, a punching tool or something like that um, to install the emitters um, to that main uh, poly line. And you can see in the graphic on the right, the different way that emitters can be used and installed along the mainline tubing. Um, so it shows there, you know, how to install a stake on um, the spaghetti tubing. And this also shows a really good, um, you know, uh, illustration of how spaghetti tubing, which is again, that thin tubing that comes off the main line um, tubing can be used to get that water, you know, two plants that are not on that main line. Okay, so you'll see things like the drip tubing that can be extended with a spaghetti tubing or a dripper that's on spaghetti tubing versus the dripper that's right next to it in that picture on the right that would be right on the main line. So um, you do need to also check with the manufacturer to determine how many emitters you can use um, and install per length of main line tubing before you lose water pressure. So, you know, if you're using 20 feet of tubing, you probably don't wanna have 50 emitters on it or no water will come out. And usually those, those guidelines are um, very easy to find either on the manufacturer's website um, or with the kit or materials that you're purchasing. So there's a number of ways you can retrofit and retrofit means making changes um, to an existing high pressure system. So there's, what that means is there's ways you can add micro irrigation with an existing system that you have. So if you have an existing sprinkler system, um, you certainly can tap into it with micro irrigation. But then again, your other option is to just install a totally separate system on an outdoor hose bib, okay? So you'll need micro irrigation to be in its own zone so you'll have to determine how many zones you have in your system and which ones you want to convert to micro irrigation. Just like with any irrigation system, you can't mix micro irrigation with rotors and sprayers. And so um, if you have six zones and two are for the lawn and they both have rotors in them, you don't wanna throw in a couple of micro you know, spray heads in there. Rather, you might have a landscape bed that is just pop-up sprayers and all of those can then be converted. Um, some might be capped, some might be converted, um, and that zone would then end up being all micro irrigation. So um, it's really important that you keep those zones separately um, because that will determine how long you need to, you turn on that, that sprinkler system to apply the right amount of water. So it can be simple to transition from an underground line or PVC line to polytubing used in micro irrigation systems. And you can see that from the example in the top photo. Um, you may need to attach a new valve for micro irrigation. And if so, you might need the help of a professional, but you certainly can do it on your own. Um, there are lots of YouTube videos on irrigation that are pretty helpful, particularly when it comes to things in the valve box. So it, it can be done for sure. I think for me, some of the hardest part of, of, of work in the valve box would be some of the electrical work. 
Um, you can consider contacting a micro irrigation company to talk to them about different ways you can retrofit your system and have and what components they have available. For example, um, Mr. Landscaper is a company in Polk County that manufactures micro irrigation for home landscapes, but their components are found, um, some of the components, um, not all of them, are found on the commercial side called MaxiJet. So MaxiJet has um, emitters that are oops, sorry. Um, so if there is a commercial side to that retail, um, you know, homeowner company, they may have different um, and and very useful and very helpful. Um, spray heads or or things for retrofitting that you may want to check into. So again, Mr. Landscaper, the commercial company is MaxiJet, and we often you know tell people to to check both of those out. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about some layout design that you could can do. Um, there are a few layout graphics that might be helpful, um, just to kind of give you some idea. Um, different ways you could, could lay out micro irrigation in a, in a vegetable garden or, or planting bed or, or whatever you, you know, want to, to use micro irrigation for. Um, and again, these are just ideas because really you can get very, very creative with micro irrigation. And again, as long as you're not exceeding the number of emitters per, um, per main line, then, then you should be fine. Um, this picture is showing how lines are laid out in a grid pattern. So you can see the bottom right, that would be the water source, you know, maybe the hose bib or even, you know, the PVC line of the, the zone. And you can see the, the main um, poly line there and then just, you know, coming off of that um, with either other poly, the half inch poly or even spaghetti tubing. Um, I would say the, the main thing to remember if you're doing a, a grid layout is, um, you'll have to put elbows at each of those. Whereas if you look to something like this, um, you can still water these plants that are laid out very grid-like, yet these lines are kind of just wound between the rows and you don't have to use all the elbows. So you don't have that very um, uh, grid-like look of that previous photo, but you can do the very same thing without having to use a lot more components. So if you can do any of the kind of winding through the landscape bed, it will, it will save you components as well. Um, and also just wanted to mention too is um, sometimes the kits come with, um, it's almost like a, a, a stake that will hold that poly into the ground. Um, it's pretty hard to lay out um, a micro irrigation system without attaching that main line to the ground in some way. Um, so I would suggest attaching it to the ground. Um, you can use the, the, the stakes that come with the system, which usually they look like a little, um, almost like a C shape that the, the tubing punches into and it stakes into the ground. Um, if you're doing a lot of it, um, we've used a uh, large, uh, state landscape staples as well. So um, you can buy those by the box, usually at a supply company um, and staple straight into the ground and that holds the poly tubing in really well. Um, here's some other options of layout and here you can see in the photo on the left, there's um, PVC um, kind of output um, that comes to the, the corner of each of these raised beds. On the photo on the right, the poly or the, the PVC tubing um, from the zone, the main system is in the middle of the beds. And so there are fittings that just attach right to the top of that PVC and the main lines are, are run from there. Um, the advantage of it being in the middle of the bed is you, know, you don't see it, um, but either way, I mean, it's a very, very similar way to do it. You'd have to do a bit more plumbing with this for sure. Um, here you can see if your hose bib faucet is right at the side of the house, and you got to get it through the lawn. That's pretty easy to do. I mean, in our in our um, you know Central Florida Florida lawns and landscapes, it's pretty easy to dig a trench. So you can take a pretty shallow trench, bury the poly tubing, and then pop it out on the other end um, in that landscape bed um, pretty easily. 
Um, so, you know, don't be afraid if you've got to go under the lawn or, or something like that. If it's pretty easy to dig, you don't have to do anything. Certainly if you're afraid of it being cut by, you know, a hose or something like, or a, 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 a shovel or, um, well, even like a um, weed whacker or something, you can bury a piece of PVC tubing and thread that poly, that black poly tubing um, through it underground as well. In our kind of mixed landscape beds with ornamentals, you can see here um, the photo on the left is using the um, micro sprayer to water kind of a general grouping of plants. And then in the photo on the right, they've used um, the poly tubing with the spaghetti lines coming off with emitters to, to irrigate directly at the base of the plants. Um, and you can see the photo on the right, the tubing is on top of the mulch. Certainly that can be under the mulch as well, if you would like, that is a, a personal preference. Um, here you can see um, an example of a, a bubbler. This is in a, a plant pot. Um, this is actually at our extension office. And what we did with the irrigation of our containers is um, we have a main poly tubing kind of running um, at the base of all of the, the containers, it's a straight line. And then as we um, installed the containers, we brought spaghetti tubing up through the, the drainage holes. And so they're right in that pot and you don't see any line, you know, coming up the side of the pot. So that's certainly something if you're, you know, irrigating something new that you haven't potted yet, you can certainly bring that spaghetti tubing up through that drainage hole and plant it and put it right in there. And um, that's, that's not been a problem for us. We've had ours that way for quite a few years now. Here again, you can see micro sprayers, um, great for using in those um, mulched beds that are right along the sidewalk, you know, watering those plants that way. Um, and then in the photo on the right, we, you know, have some wildflower plantings and things. And we, we tend to use a lot of these um, 360 um, emitters that um, water a general area just because of the way we have some of our perennials and things planted at our office. And again, um, you know, after these plants are established, we may want to go in and just turn off this spray head and you can see you can do that. There's a little uh, black dial at the base of the emitter there. We just turn that one off or, you know, it's very easy to remove them and plug them um, if you don't need them anymore or use them for establishment and then pull the whole system out and use it somewhere else. <clears throat> there is some maintenance required with micro irrigation. So when we talk about things like burying it under soil, burying it under mulch, um, it's a little bit harder to detect if there's something going wrong because the maintenance with micro irrigation sy systems is um, usually in the connected pieces. And so frequent inspection is really the key to keeping on top of of any issues with your micro irrigation system. Um, clogged emitters and cut lines are the main things to walk, watch out for. So, you know, when you're doing your irrigation, irrigation system checks or you're walking your landscape, um, you know, doing a general scouting routine, you know, looking for your, looking at your plants and checking for um, issues insects, pests, all that sort of thing. It's a good time to also take a look at your, your irrigation system. So I'll look for signs of wet or dry soil or decline in plant health. Unfortunately, if you've got all your components buried, sometimes what happens is you see one, you know, brown plant that you've not noticed before and it's dead because it was, you know, just the emitter was clogged and it, you know, we, it wasn't very obvious. Um, because it's a drip. So you've got to get up close and personal and look at it. So it can be tr tricky to tell if a drip emitter is, is clogged. Um, a micro sprayer is usually easier to see because you know they're above ground and spraying and you can tell um, most of the time um, it is this clogged filters. This is what it looks like in a, the base of um, one of the micro sprayers. All of the components kind of just twist apart in that little blue, um, piece in there is a filter. Uh, normally what we do is just pull them out, rinse them with water and stick them back in. Um, very similar to, to cleaning out a filter, um, you know, in your pop-up sprayer and stuff like that. Um, and again, just be really careful. These parts are all just this, you know, plastic that can be really 
easily damaged by mowing and maintenance equipment, shovels and, and things like that. So if you are using it in a landscape bed, you know, where it's, you know, lining the bed between the lawn and the, the mulch, you know, make sure your, your maintenance company or if you do the maintenance are mindful of, of those and, and um, you know, kind of keep away from them for sure. Okay, and so as we wrap up and get to the end, before we get to questions, I wanted to mention some of our resources here. We have a good publication on micro irrigation for the home landscape. Um, and then there's also some really inf good information I mentioned um, earlier on some of those water savings. Um, and there are some documents that talk a little bit more about water saving potential of um, changing out um, uh, high volume irrigation to micro irrigation and how much water you could potentially save. And you can certainly calculate that on a water bill as well. So you could see uh, potentially a, a decent amount of savings there. Um, so there is a lot of information available. And then there at the bottom, um, we have some references on um, our blog on different ways that you can conserve water. And we can get all of these links to you because I'm sure if you're trying to you know, write them down <laughs> really, really fast. It's, it's, they're very long links. So, so I can make sure that you get all of these, these links as well. Uh, this is all of our information. We offer lots of workshops. Again, I've mentioned that we do uh, many of the same um, workshops and webinars that, that, that are done in um, Hernando County and um, some that we have coming up here in June. We have some uh, very similar um, offerings as far as we're talking about the rainy season this month and we do um, 15 minute webinars every Tuesday at noon and have a you know short topic and our welcome to the rainy season is what we're offering in June. And you can see here we've got um, today at um, noon, we have some lawn pests and we're talking about weeds and hurricane prep and things like that. Um, and then actually, um, uh, next week, um, we're offering a, a class on edible flowers. So, um, you know, take advantage again of all these county extension offices that are offering so many programs right now um, online and, and um, you know, join as many as you find um, helpful and, and interesting. And, and we do put many of ours on our YouTube channel and you can watch many of them later as well. Okay, so um, I think now we can take some questions. Um, we can, again, check the, the chat or um, if you want to, if you know how to use the raise your hand feature, we can do that as well for, for taking any questions you might have. Okay, we already have a couple questions here in the chat. And I think it's set so that they only go to me. I don't know, Anne, you may be able to see them also, but I'm not sure. Yep, I can pull the chat up. Uh, oh, okay. oh, no, I can't. Nope. <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to you. You'll have to feed the questions to me. <laughs> no problem. I can take care of that. First question is, uh, will this presentation be available for download? Like I said, we are recording this class and we will have it back up on our Facebook page. Our office's Facebook page, the short name for it is Hernando EXT. That's short for Hernando Extension. Um, Hopefully everybody on here today has already liked our page and follows it. So it takes a few days for Hernando County government broadcasting to finish up the video and for us to put it back on YouTube and everything. But in a few days when it is, or probably the beginning of next week when it is ready, we'll put that on our Facebook page. And Johanna asked, should well water be tested? Can it hurt a vegetable garden if not? So is there any danger with well water? Um, no, I think well water should be fine. Um, you can certainly test um, test it to to see what's in it if you're you're curious. Um, obviously, things like reclaimed water aren't recommended for edible gardens, but you know we recommend people at least get for reclaimed get a reading of what's in that just for the knowledge of it being applied in a landscape bed to know if any you know additional nutrients are maybe not needed because of whatever's in that reclaimed water. Um, I think you may have to use a private service to get well water tested, though. I don't think the university offers that unless you know of a place, Bill. I'm not sure about that one. I know the university can test 
water for nutrients, okay. but they generally don't test it for pathogens. So if you're on a well and you're worried about maybe there's bacteria or something in it, if you contact your county's health department, they can help you out there. Yeah. And very important because I saw this kind of mentioned just yesterday on a Facebook group. If you pull your irrigation water from a drainage ditch or a canal or a pond, don't use that on your edible crops because that stagnant water, that is some really potentially dirty stuff. It can, it normally contains salmonella, could contain E. coli and a lot of other bad things. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So yeah, if, if we're talking about edible plants, stick with your, your potable water system. Again, using that hose bib on the outside of your house, that's a real easy way to set up for, for your, your edible plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that way you know it's safe for your edibles. Yeah. And we also have a question. The tape irrigation system, since it comes with the holes already, do we have to place it right on the plant or can it be a couple inches away? Um, as close as you can get it, just because if you think about our typical soils um, with, with sand, we have a lot of downward movement. We don't get a lot of lateral movement with our water that we're applying. So really at the base of the plant, as close as you can get it is, is ideal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I put a link in the chat to our webpage, hernandoextension.com. So if you go there, that's a full listing of all of our other upcoming classes. Uh, as soon as we get them planned and organized, we put them on there. So if you keep keep checking back, if you bookmark that, keep checking it, you'll see all of the classes that we have coming up. And here's a good question. Can a rain barrel be used as the water source for micro irrigation systems? Yes, that is a good question. I was going to mention that if no one asked. So yes, it can. Um, going back to using water on edible gardens, typically we do not recommend that you use rain water for irrigating edible gardens. But that's not to say, again, you can't use it for all of your other watering needs. I mean, you can use it on your, your ornamentals and things too, but don't forget about potted plants that, you know, the rainwater can be used for indoor house plants and, you know, any potted ornamentals that you have outside. So yeah, so typically what people do is put a very small pond pump into the rain barrel. Um, I don't know of any great solar options for pond pumps. There are probably some out there. I don't know. That would make it a lot easier because otherwise the pond pump um, is in the bottom of the barrel and then you have to, you have a, a plug, right, to run it. It's electrical. So you have to have access to plugging it in. So um, I've seen where people do that. They're, you know, they've got their, their porch and they've got an outdoor um, outlet and they plug it in there. And then so the um, pond pump is in the bottom of the rain barrel. And then the poly tubing is connected right to that and you can pump the water out um, of the rain barrel into that whatever type of system you want to use um, you may want to put a filter on that could tend to get clogged more because if you think about all the stuff coming off your roof you probably have a pretty fine screen on your um your rain barrel probably like window screening but that's not going to catch all of the little stuff that could be clogging up a micro irrigation system so you know, give it a try and see, um, maybe use it on um, a micro spray system so you can kind of catch it if you see that, just because it's a little easier to see if they're clogged or whatever. Um, and then you can just pull the bottom off and clean emitters that way. Or you can always put it, you know, a, a, one of those external filters on it before it gets to the, to the system itself. But yep, it can, it can definitely be done. Okay, we have a question from Lisa. And she says, what is the best way to irrigate tower gardens? I know Lisa and I know she's talking about um, the hydroponics towers like Vertigro type tower. Uh, I'm torn between 360 emitter or direct emitter with spaghetti tube at each tower pole. Um, I'm not sure what the size of those towers are. Are those the small, um, because you don't, the three, most of the 360, well, if it's a 360 micro sprayer, most of them throw too far. A bubbler might work. Um, 
And it also depends, you know, a, a drip emitter would work if you're putting like one plant per um, tower container or whatever it might be. Um, so I'm not sure that I'd use a micro sprayer. I think maybe um, a, a typically a bubbler or even a, a drip emitter might work. I think a bubbler would work pretty well. Mm -hmm. Because I know the uh, drip emitter with spaghetti tube, the mm -hmm. water tends to irrigate the size of a quarter straight down. It does not go. Doesn't spread enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the nice thing about that too would be those, many of the bubblers, I mean, the bubblers, you can turn them on and off right at the, the emitter. So uh -huh. if it's in there and you know, you put something in there and you're like, I don't, it does not need any more water, but the thing down in the other part of the tower does, you can uh -huh. just turn them off individually. Okay. Can you use micro irrigation for field crops? Uh, certainly. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can definitely uh, use it. I mean, I think you'd have to calculate costs and stuff to depend, to figure out if it was, you know, feasible. Um, but the company that's in Polk County, Mr. Landscaper, MaxiJet, I mean, they started with citrus. That's what they are mm -hmm. using it for. So uh, MaxiJet has um, been used to irrigate citrus for a long time. You know, I think I've noticed those companies, they have different setups. So uh, they have a special setup for blueberry growers and whatever commercial, whatever people are growing commercially, they mm -hmm. kind of have the custom setup for them. Yeah. And most of the company, I mean, I know at least this one, but I'm sure they're all very similar. You know, if you talk to one of their reps or something, I'm sure they can help you kind of figure out what components you need um, as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So which one is better, soaker hose or drip irrigation? Um, so typically the, the, I would say drip tubing. Um, the, the issue with soaker hose, and I, I know it's still recommended. In fact, the other day I was looking at it and I wasn't quite sure if we were recommending it still. Um, I know with soaker hose, it's, there's no measurement of how much water is coming out that I'm aware of. Um, so just be mindful of that. And then also, I mean, think about the whole entire soaker hose is dripping basically. So um, if it's not being, utilized on those plant roots that are right there, it could be just a bunch of wasted water. Whereas you get again, more precision with that micro irrigation. Um, I would say either type. So if you decide to use soaker hoses, again, those are things you don't see running typically or not seeing that spray is put a timer on it just because uh, you think you remember that it's on just like some of the drippers and just the little battery timers are pretty easy to use. Um, pretty cheap and will save you money, you know, if you're buying like a $30 timer versus more that'll be on your water bill if you forget that it's on. Okay, we have one final question here. <clears throat> Can we use rainwater on baby fruit trees that won't be fruiting yet? Um, I don't see a problem with it. I think the guidance, and I don't know if you know, Bill, for rain barrel use was, um, you don't want the water touching the parts of the plant that you're eating, I believe is what it says. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so you can use um, uh, rain barrel water on trees or anything that's either not fruiting yet mm -hmm. <clears throat> or is very, very tall and you're watering it just at ground level. Right. <clears throat> so the so big issue that... is getting that potentially contaminated water actually on the food. Right. Yeah, don't, you don't want it touching the edible part of the, whatever it is. Okay, and we have a couple other questions on here. Um, <clears throat> we're not giving out a specific e-certificate for this class. This is primarily geared for homeowners and residential use is not really for a CEU for any kind of uh, professional license. Um, if you'd like, verification that you attended if you send me an email. Um, let me go ahead and put my email down here if anybody has any other questions. Feel free to email me.
And like I said, if you go to HernandoExtension.com, you'll see a list of all of our other upcoming classes. And <clears throat> I think that's all the questions there. So, and thank you so much. That was great. That was a, a topic that I know that I've never covered on here before. Yeah, no problem. And if, um, if people have specific, you know, questions about the topic, um, I mean, I know I'm not in your county, but I'm very happy to answer any, you know, <clears throat> micro irrigation, irrigation questions, um, you know, that, that somebody might have. So you can, you can still send them my way if you have a question. Sure. We all work together well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yep. no matter what county you live in, you have an extension office or feel free to contact one of the two of us. Yes. Mm -hmm.